a coach Eli Garen Gator, Chest of Firkin, Fulcher Roof, Elia Gagas, Akohore is privileged in our era with them, Hainas Sivin, Gwil Shansa, and Casa Liedson, a V Portugal, Candace Natras, and above a half of Tiestar and a Herring. May I say, first of all, her delighted Sabina and I are to welcome you to Oris and Uthron and how pleased we are to have the opportunity of hosting this reception of the descendants of those Irish men and women who represented the Oledin at the Anglo-Irish Treaty and who worked in so many different ways to serve the negotiations in London in December 1921. May I take the opportunity as I begin as well of, uh, of, of thanking uh, our harpist for providing us with such a Made of week as Siobhan. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I do want to thank n just a number of other people, including, of course, Dr. Ronan Fawcett and all of those who have been in touch with us in the ORS and assisting us. And I think as well it was very valuable in our preparations to have available to us the book edited by Fiona Murray and Ida Segarra, their book, men and, The Men and Women of the Anglo Irish Treaty Negotiations. 1921. It is such an important period in Irish history and in such a defining event. Throughout late September and early October, advisers and experts were appointed to the delegation. The economic advisers were Dermot Fawcett, Charles Oldham, Lionel Smith Gordon. The financial advisers were Henry Connell Mangan. John J. Murphy, Timothy Smitty, and Joseph Brennan, and Sean Milroy was an advisor on Ulster, and George Manahan was legal advisor. All of this establishes another point that is very important to bear in mind, is that a government, if you like, a counter-administration, was already in place and available and hence you had so much expertise being provided. It would be very wrong to think, in fact, that the people in the event later on today we will attend, the people were being introduced to the only administration. This was the administration in anticipation. It had already been there since 1919. Many of the people I've, whose names I've mentioned had been working for quite a while. The women who were there were extraordinary. Catherine McKinn, indeed, uh, uh, was private secretary to Griffith, giving her unique access to some of the most significant documents and correspondence in Irish history at that time, and to the people ultimately responsible for the negotiations. And in addition to Catherine McKinn, other women delegates included Elizabeth, known as Lily O'Brennan, uh, Gertie Conrad, and the, Ly the Lyon sisters, Ellie and Alice. And we've been very looking at the re their great, great ne ne nephew, this memorabilia, which is so we have just had the opportunity of looking at. And they're extraordinary. At a very young age, 19 years of age, there were stenographers and clerical assistants on Collins' staff on my, in the finance office. Again, I repeat, there was a finance office. There were civil administrations in the different departments, agriculture, education, health, and so forth. They had both worked beside him throughout the War of Independence. I think Gertie Conroy had commenced work for O'Hagerty in the Secretariat of the Dole in the summer of 1921. That would have been O'Hagerty had also worked and kept moving in relation to the national loan and the alternative financial structure of the state. O'Brennan was private secretary to Childers and had been part of the first delegation led by De Valera in London in July, at which of course there were four meetings with Lloyd George. Whilst all of these women and men had in common a belief in public service, and it is interesting that so many of their families have in fact gone on in that tradition, they put themselves on the line, as did their families, risking everything for a greater good for the benefit of many, and at their different levels of expertise. And what a monumental moment in our nation's history the treaty negotiations constitute there can be little doubt that those who represented the Olean at the negotiations had all, they all had the most honourable intentions, were concerned to interpret what could not be anticipated in terms of a definitive mandate, 
and they did their very best in an extremely challenging context. The situation could not have been more tense. The public could not be more anxious. A fragile truce following the War of Independence that had cost the lives of so many as 2,300. And it all followed, if you like, the misnamed Spanish flu of 2018. There was so much that had left the public drained, uh, but undefeated, struggling with relentless attacks, reprisals and burnings, and weary from illness and fighting and death. And while for nationalists of different persuasions and views, the ideal settlement might have been the creation of a sovereign United Irish Republic, Arthur Griffith of the delegation, and earlier perhaps at his meetings with Lloyd George in London in July, Eamon de Valera, who was now at home in Dublin, appreciated that the British representatives would not accept such terms. Griffith's objective was to maximise such degree of Irish independence as might gain a united Ireland, even if it be in the future. It would soon become very clear to all of the Irish representatives involved that a unitary 32-county Irish Republic would not be conceded by the British. And I think perhaps there was... New history shows us, I think, that there was an underestimation from the Irish side of the symbolism associated with the crown and empire for reasons more of exemplary threat than of any pompous hubris. Throughout the negotiations, Lord George was insistent that Ireland must remain within the British Empire and accept the crown as head of state. But this had very much to do with keeping the symbolism of the empire intact. Collins and Griffith, in hammering out the final details, achieved British concessions <clears throat> on the wording of the oath and the defence and trade clauses, together with the addition of a boundary commission that could consider implementation of the treaty and indeed had a clause upholding the possibility of Irish unity. Collins and Griffith, in turn, convinced the other plenipotentiaries to sign the treaty with the final decisions to sign made as a result of private discussions at 22 Hands Place late on the 5th of December 1921. And the treaty was signed soon after 2 a.m. on the 6th of December in the cabinet room of Tim Downing Street. In what has become a well-quoted remark, Michael Collins later claimed that at the last minute Lloyd George threatened the Irish delegates with a renewal of, quote, terrible and immediate war if the treaty was not signed at once. Robert Barton later noted that at one time he, that is Lord George, particularly addressed himself to me and said very solemnly that those who are not for peace must take full responsibility for the war that would immediately follow refusal by any delegate to sign the Articles of Agreement. Lord George's refusal to relinquish the menace of war is a defining aspect of the treaty negotiations. Indeed, the threat of conflict of renewed and increased violence with the force of a now released imperial strength and drawing to him what was perhaps self-serving advice from Dublin Castle that intelligence continued to suggest that a military victory was still possible. This threat would hover over every turn in the talks, from the truce to the commencement of treaty talks, indeed right up to their denouement on the 6th of December, in 6th of December 1921. Yet there was movement moving much further towards autonomy than the 1920 legislation. The free state under the treaty was now to be given complete independence in its domestic affairs, powers to levy all taxes, regulate foreign trade, raise an army and considerable freedom in relation to foreign policy. From a nationalist perspective, the main defect of the text was that Ireland would not become a republic. It remained within the empire, with the crown remaining as head of state. In addition, Britain retained its naval bases, thus compromising Irish neutrality in a future war. Partition II remained, though it was anticipated that the findings of the future Boundary Commission could lead to unity. The treaty itself is a short document. As Dr Thomas More has remarked, the brevity of the treaty is understandable. The text allowed for the creative use of ambiguity on key points of international law. 
the provisions were sufficiently flexible to allow people from both sides to see what they wanted in them. Insistence on greater clarity was judged to have been incompatible with the possibility of mutual agreement. As Dr Moore puts it, only a short and ambiguous document could create a viable settlement in 1921, which is why the treaty took the form it did. The treaty debates that ensued were difficult, at times bitter and bruising, but also impressive, comprising, as they did, a robust stock-taking of the position of the contending parties, through which their differing views of and recognition of the efforts of the past, parliamentary and otherwise, were outlined, and their hopes for the future were invoked and made public. The divisions in the Dole were perhaps more representative of divisions among nationalist sentiment and activism than there were of the divisions in the wider society. Arthur Griffith's aspirational words from the 19th of December 1921 are worth recalling. I have signed a treaty of peace between Ireland and Great Britain. I believe that treaty will lay foundations of peace and friendship between the two nations. What I have signed, I shall stand by in the belief that the end of the conflict of centuries is at hand. Gavin Duffy, speaking in the Dáil two days later, I am going to recommend the treaty to you, very reluctantly, but very sincerely, because I see no alternative. Robert Barton said that he had broken his oath of allegiance to the Republic when he signed the agreement, but did so because I judged that violation to be the lesser of alternative outrages forced upon me and between which I was compelled to choose. The greater outrage, wouldn't be averted, that stood behind such sentiments was a tragic return to war and possible military defeat and devastation. Colum Kinney has noted in a recent book, having originally supported de Valera's decision not to leave the team in London, Barton had later pleaded with him to come to Downing Street, but his plea fell on deaf ears. Eamon de Valera on the 19th of December made it clear that he opposed the treaty because, quote, it would not end the centuries of conflict between the two nations of Great Britain and Ireland, and that it would, quote, not reconcile our own people, much less reconcile Britain and Ireland. The emphasis in the debates was placed on the possibilities and limitations of the constitutional options available, but scant mention is made of the forms that the economy might take or the divisions within it, of society or its institutions in terms of how life might now be impacted. For example, in both health, housing, education, immigration, for either the majorities or the political minorities of the populations north and south. But yet on all of these matters, your ancestors had in fact done and completed detailed work. The fate of Southern Unionists, too, was part of what was overlooked, church-state relations and what might be anticipated as actions on the part of the likely hegemonies, North and South. It didn't figure very much in the speeches. Republican Socialist Padre O'Donnell opposed the treaty on structural grounds such as the unfinished and unequal nature of land distribution. And although Sinn Féin had also campaigned to preserve the Irish language, Bizarrely, this issue receives very scant discussion. Partition, however, was a major issue, with Ulstermen like Sean McEntee speaking strongly against this clause, but of course after Christmas coming back and relaying to the door when it resumed that his constituents had were strongly for the treaty. All of the deputies, in their consultation with their constituencies during the Christmas break of 1921, were given a very strong message in favour of the treaty. Media and the church were in favour. And while the Dole voted to approve the treaty, the objectors, including McIntyre, refused to accept it. This combined with divisions on the role of militants and the armed forces, resulted eventually in a bloody civil war of over ten months' duration. But we must never forget that behind these divisions stood the shadow of a looming, non-departed and very proximate empire. The position of common law 
deserves further study, notably all of the six female TDs, perhaps aware of or anticipating the fact they would not be conceded, what, that, what they would be conceded would be a less than equal role than that which they had played in the struggle for independence itself and its infrastructure, were strongly in favour of continuing the war until, as those speaking in the debates put it, a 32-county republic was established. The further research I refer to would be in relation to common among throughout the country. Was this a view derived from an island-wide consultation? Was the view offered drawn from the most painful of personal and family experience? The treaty itself, for some few parliamentary observers in London, who had been interested in the general international independence movement of which it was a part, was described as having been procured by coercion and duress. Gretchen Freeman has written, the threat of renewed violence and confusion over the Irish delegates' precise mission casts a shadow over the negotiations before they had even begun. Yes, members of the Olean might be split, but the nation was giving its blessing to, blessing to a settlement that was seen both at home and abroad as the best hope for what might be a long road to peace. The ensuing civil war tragically claimed more lives than the War of Independence that preceded it and left Irish society divided and embittered for decades. So it divided my own family. Yet, as terrible as the events transpired in Ireland, the spectre of what might have been if an agreement in 1921 had not been reached has examples for consideration in other independence movements seeking their exit from empire. In assessing the Treaty Economy of Ireland, suggests that it is useful to ask questions beyond what Ireland failed to gain, as is the dominant narrative, and to give space to what Britain failed to hold. The treaty was a climb down for the British Empire and represented an attempt to extract itself with honour from what was so many of its parliamentarians called the Irish morass, which tells us a lot. The British government had, through the treaty, sought to define the very essence of Anglo-Irish relations and feared that in its own exemplary way, Irish independence, if conceded, would serve as an example and an inspiration as indeed it did throughout the emancipatory decolonizations of the 20th century. As we continue to remember and recall this period in our nation's history and to seek to do so ethically, and with such moral purpose as we leave us prepared for the future, it is important that we conduct our remembrance in a manner that allows for such a reflection to be inclusive, open to all evidence, narrative hospitality, must always be our goal and commemoration. But as philosopher, French philosopher Paul Ricoeur tells us, it requires generous effort. It requires, too, reaching an accommodation with conflicting versions of the past, which is merely a stage in the journey, via understanding, to what might be the destination that is forgiveness for past art, neglect or omission. A destination which in so many areas of conflict at home and abroad, past and present, many find difficult. Some, we must acknowledge, may, may remain so hurt, too filled with hurt, to uneven undertake such a journey. But it is only through such an inclusive, never evasive ethical remembering as we now have an opportunity to attempt to undertake as we recall these painful but let us never forget emancipatory moments in our nation's birth. It is important that we seek to avoid any reinvocation of the blinding categories of censure or denunciation or omission or indeed revenge and bitterness that might be abused ever as fuel for present or future divisions. Narrative hospitality requires the generous openness to hearing each other's narrative. Narrative flexibility requires the generous readiness to recognise that there are multiple narratives from 1912 to 1922, but that there is an attempt, that there is no attempt at imposing any single superior normative narrative. Understanding is what we're about, helped as we are and will be 
by new finds and researches and documents such as we've seen that allow for narratives to change. Narrative plurality recognises the complexity of history, the illusions and limitations of knowledge, and that our narratives are diverse, provisional and plural, and always must be open to new facts as they are discussed. The option of avoidance by enforced silence will serve nobody, and enforced or affected amnesia as to actions that have led to lost, damaged or changed lives through the generations will serve no purpose, quite the contrary. We have to live with our complete truth of past and present. There are always, have been always those who saw, thankfully, the beauty of peace and forgiveness. So may I say that Sabine and I are so glad that you will have the opportunity, I hope later, to view the 16 birch trees which we planted here in the grounds of the Oris in 2019 to commemorate those who were executed after the 1916 Rising. I'm particularly glad that Judge Barton and Miss Anne-Marie Barton are with us, mindful of fact that it was a proposal from Robert Barton, who, in delivering the message from the first meeting of Dolan in January 1919, conveyed this wish for the planting of trees, which had been agreed by the first Dole. Those birch trees planted in our time by Sabine and I are a symbol of rebirth and new beginnings, which of course can have a special resonance for us all at this time. So as we continue to mark these pivotal moments as part of our nation's centennial commemorations, let us together embrace and welcome such narrative complexity Cultivate memory as an instrument that we can use, make available in its honesty and fullness for all of the possibilities, for the living, so that we may realise a shared but diverse memory at peace, unburdened by distortions, and ready for an ethical remembering with a capacity in it to replace any past entrenchments, as well as offering an openness to others as a strong foundation of a shared, agreed, enhanced, and fulfilling future of peace. Mila Buikas, Esparvanak, Arishma, Fortuna, Vili.